right, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Yusuf Khalifa from Atlanta, Georgia at Emory. Uh, so the topic for today is uh, learning cataract surgery in the operating room strategies for attendings and uh, residents. Um, and uh, my financial disclosure is I am a consultant for Carl Zeiss Meditech. So this slide here is just uh, showing how stressful cataract surgery training can be. Um, on the left is my colleague, Dr. Jacqueline O'Banion, and on the right is me, Yusuf Khalifa. Um, one day after surgery, I got a text message with an image from O'Banion telling me this resident really stresses me out. And you can see the sweat marks. And sure enough, the next day I was operating with the next resident. I had the same sweat marks. So uh, attendings do um, suffer a lot of stress. And um, uh, why do we do it? And I look back at my life and I think of some of the things that happened in my life that make me enjoy teaching. Um, and I want to share three episodes from my life that make me um, really enjoy being in the operating with residents and doing skills transfer with them. Uh, the first is, um, I remember clearly when I was very young being excited about uh, learning to ride a bike and my father um, running behind me holding the, the bicycle and me pedaling and he wouldn't let me fall. He made sure that I was safe um, and he was really interested in me learning and I was super interested in learning how to ride a bike. Um, and I think it's that same feeling um, when you are um, training and learning to do cataract surgery. There's a tremendous amount of joy in the whole process where um, you are enjoying seeing this resident blossom. They put in so much effort through undergraduate and medical school and internship and two or three years of residency. And you see them really blossoming into um, a cataract surgeon, which makes you makes me extremely happy. And I think the same feeling of joy should be in the resident. Um, obviously, uh, when things are good, there's a lot of joy, but I think even when things don't go well, there should be a sense of trust that if things don't go well, um, that we're not going to throw each other under the bus, and I'm not going to try to blame the resident for a complication, and the resident's not going to try, try to blame me for a complication. Um, and it's a shared interest in being successful. The resident wants to be successful, and me as the attending really wants that resident to succeed. Um, and I want to also uh, transition them to independence, meaning I'm not going to sit there running behind them, uh, holding the seat of the, the, the bicycle as they're, they're learning to do cataract surgery. They have to be able to leave residency and go out and do cataract surgery on their own. So I feel that is a responsibility that I can't be constantly coaching them. There is a gradation of coaching and slowly we take the training wheels off. Slowly I take my hand off of the seat. Slowly I stop pushing. Um, so the next question is, uh, when a resident suffers a surgical complication, what should be done? Um, a, blame the resident for the mistake and write an incident report. Uh, B, embarrass the resident in front of other attendings at a departmental meeting. Uh, C, review the case of the resident to identify areas for improvement. Or D, suspend the resident's surgical privileges. Um, I think it's really important that we learn from mistakes, that we go back and look at the video and we um, assess where the mistake happened so it doesn't happen again, or at least we learn from the situation. It was just really emphasizing the concept that uh, we're a team. Um, I like to celebrate my residents, so I'll put them on my Instagram and uh, highlight the amazing work they're doing. Uh, so these are some of the screenshots uh, that I've taken over the, uh, over the years of my residents doing great cataract surgery. So I told you there are three stories. This is the uh, second story that I sort of lean on when I'm uh, thinking about being how, how to make my resident succeed. I turned uh, 15 years old. Uh, here in the United States, you start learning to drive at the age of 15. Uh, and my mom put me in her Volvo, her gray Volvo. And uh, she was sitting next to me and my sister was in the back seat. She was five years old. And uh, she tells me to drive. And my reference of how to drive is the arcade games where you go in and you just hit the foot pedal, right? You push it all the way down. So I get behind the wheel and I push the foot pedal, the gas all the way down and the car engine revs really high and we just take off and my mom yells stop. So I take my foot off the gas and I slam the brakes and my sister flips in the back seat. Uh, what I'm trying to tell you in this story is I didn't have the right frame of reference for driving a car. Um, I was taking my experience on an arcade game and saying, oh, this must be how you drive a car, and therefore let's do it the same way. Um, I think it's really important um, that we take into account uh, that we have residents with different personality, life experiences, and perceptions. And sometimes those life experiences, perceptions, and personalities don't necessarily translate into success right off the bat in the operating room. Uh, you have to calibrate that resident. Ways of calibrating the resident 
um, our wet lab so that they can practice. Uh, a simulator also helps, obviously, with uh, developing appropriate hand motions and um, uh, technique. Um, I have found with uh, unsupervised wet lab and simulators, sometimes residents learn to hold instruments incorrectly. So um, some supervision and uh, making sure that the time they spent in the wet lab is as well worth it. Um, and then the, the next point is we all form a construct about how to do something new. Um, and you wanna make sure that construct is accurate. I think a lot of residents come into the operating room, some of them over uh, get overstimulated and very anxious and they wanna really hold tight to the instruments and they can't move their hands because they feel like they have to be in control of that eye by holding tightly on the instruments. So that's a frame of reference, a construct that they've developed that is uh, gonna hold them back as they progress in cataract surgery. So I'm gonna give you the last of the three stories and we're gonna move into some surgical videos. Uh, but I remember very clearly uh, being a resident at the Augusta, Georgia VA Medical Center. And I remember operating on my first cataract surgery and it was an extra cap. And I made the incision and I put, put an instrument into the eye for the first time. And I felt a sense of being completely overwhelmed of being inside an eye with an instrument. Um, and I felt like the room was spinning and I couldn't hear or see or process information. My attending was talking and I couldn't respond to the prompts. Um, so you're gonna have a resident reach the extent, you're gonna have them reach a point where they are unable to process the situation. The stress of the surgery is too much for them to, to deal with. And at that point, it's gonna be really important that you realize it as the attending and take over for that resident and get them over that stressful situation that they're in. Um, so if you have reached the, the resident's limit in their dexterity or mental capacity, uh, they will struggle and be stressed and they will be discouraged. And I think it's really important that you maintain a resident's confidence as they're uh, going through training. Um, and as I mentioned many times, too much stress renders the trainee unable to process instructions or what they are seeing. Like they just, their, their brain is shutting down. Um, so, those are the three stories I mentioned to you. The first, uh, like riding the bike, that there's joy, there should be trust between the uh, resident and the attending. Um, I mentioned to you the story of me learning to drive and not having the correct frame of reference that um, I didn't know how to drive a car and I assumed my arcade experience was going to translate. And then the third story was being overwhelmed in the operating room as a new, as a new surgeon and uh, just sharing with you that feeling of uh, being overwhelmed and not being able to process or act on the situation. Um, another thing I like to keep in mind as I'm training residents is that there are stages of learning. The first stage is you don't know that you don't know. And I think a lot of residents will spend the first couple of years of training, they'll go into an operating room and squirt a cornea with BSS and think, oh, wow, this is so easy. It's 10 minutes or 15 minutes or six minutes or whatever they've seen. Oh, it's so cool to put in monofocals or you know, torix or whatever. Um, and they think it's just simple and they don't know that they don't know. Um, and then very quickly after they start, they realize they're actually doing their own surgeries. They realize that they don't know. They know that they don't know. Um, and hopefully by the 50th or 75th cataract or 100th cataract, their skills are starting to pick up, but they still don't know that they know. And then hopefully before they, they graduate from residency, they know that they know. Um, so here are some pearls for, um, Cataract surgery, um, things to think about discussing with your resident front of mind for the resident and for the trainee. Number one pearl is visualization. Before you go into the operating room, the night before as a resident, you need to sit down and imagine yourself doing the surgery, like close your eyes and hold your hands up and imagine doing a paracentesis incision. Imagine putting a cannula in, uh, putting the, the lidocaine. Imagine putting the viscoelastic in. Imagine making your keratome incision. Imagine the cystotome and the utrata forceps, the hydro dissection, the rotation of the lens. You are imagining and you're sort of moving your hands um, to recreate the, the scenario you're going to be in, in in the next day. Um, imagine your foot on the FACO foot pedal and what you're going to be doing with your foot and how you're going to be moving the FACO probe. How are you going to disassemble that lens? How are you going to approach the quadrants to take them out? What are you going to do with the cortex? I think visualization uh, is extremely important. Elite athletes obviously are um, spending a lot of time imagining, watching videos and imagining their performance and what they're going to do on the playing field. I think for a surgeon, it can um, uh, it's, it's a great way to prepare for the operating room and improve your performance from day to day. 
Um, the next pearl is watch all your videos and watch them over and over. Even the ones that you think you did good on, you need to watch the video and see how can I improve? Oh, there was too much downtime after I put in the lidocaine and I didn't grab the OVD fast enough. Oh, my, my, my keratome incision was not the perfect geometry. I should have been tilting the blade this way or that way, heel up, heel down, um, so on and so forth. The FACO instrument, I moved too much with my FACO tip. I should have been further back. I should have been moving the, you know, uh, turning the bevel of the FACO tip. Um, so, you know, watching the videos and especially what I do at my institution is I have two video conferences a month where the residents bring in the videos that I staffed. And we watch the videos and I quiz all the residents in the room. So I bring all the medical students and residents on rotation into a room and we project the video and we discuss the thought process, the technique, the hand position, how we manage complications. All those things are done as a group uh, as well. So I, I highly recommend that uh, for you to set that up in your institution where you do a video, a surgical video conference and uh, review uh, even straightforward videos. There are great learning points that can be highlighted for the uh, residents. Another, another uh, pearl that I didn't put on here is it's important that uh, residents get to the operating room uh, before they um, before they actually have to be the surgeon. So I recommend that a resident come in and be the scrub tech for a few cases so they know the order of the instruments, they know how to pass an instrument, how to set up the machine. Um, all those things are really important. Um, the next pearl is patient selection. So be very careful when selecting a patient. Oftentimes residents are gonna be very excited about signing up patients and wanting to do a lot of surgery. Um, and sometimes you can miss things. You might miss an epiretinal membrane or you might miss a dry eye or you might miss an anterior basement membrane dystrophy or you um, might not do a good job explaining the expected outcome from cataract surgery to the patient. The problem with poor patient selection and setting um, and, and poorly setting the patient expectations is that you might do a good surgery, but if the patient is unhappy after the surgery, even after a good surgery, because you didn't select a good patient for the surgery, um, you're gonna have an unhappy patient on your hands and that really hurts the psyche of the resident. It hurts the whole morale of the entire clinic. Um, so be very careful who you sign up for surgery, make sure you are uh, doing surgery on patients that you would do, even if your mom, uh, you would do surgery on your mom, right? So this situation, if my mom were in it, I would take her to the operating room and do cataract surgery for her. So uh, make sure you treat your patients like family um, and make sure you see a good outcome for the patient on the front end. And at the beginning, you might not know um, what are good uh, outcome patients gonna look like on the front end, but you involve your attendings in the selection process. Um, pearl number four is make sure you know how to look at an um, IOL biometry sheet and that you select the appropriate lenses for your patient. I want to stress um, right now, that it doesn't really highlight it here explicitly, but be very careful of the low myo patient, the minus one, minus two, minus three patient. Um, if you take that patient and make them plano sometimes, often actually, uh, you'll find an unhappy patient because you've taken away their ability to read without glasses on. And now you're reprogramming their brain to put glasses on for reading um, and they just don't like it very much. Uh, the next pearl is make sure you do a meticulous prep and drape. The last thing we want is an endophthalmitis or a complication, or you don't wanna be operating with lashes in your field. It just causes a lot of stress when the, when the speculum isn't incorrectly or there are lashes blocking your view. So do a nice job prepping and draping and making sure you keep the lashes out of your field. The next pearl is really important and um, that is uh, doing a timeout. Uh, timeout has multiple uh, components to it. The first part of the timeout is that you know everybody's name in the room. Make sure you know who your anesthetist is. Make sure you know who your scrub tech is. And make sure you know the name of your, your uh, circulating nurse. And definitely need to know the name of your attending and the resident. So um, bef before you start operating, you want to be able to turn around and say, hey, Kevin, please give them more anesthesia right? Or please get me some more OVD, Rachel, or whatever, you know, just make sure you the, the team feels like they're included um, in the process. Uh, the other uh, piece of advice I have for you on the timeout, make sure you have the right patient and make sure you have the correct eye. And I know it sounds silly, but there can be um, issues with um, bringing the wrong patient back out of order, for example, or draping the correct eye and operating or, you know, prepping the right eye, but draping the incorrect eye. Uh, I wouldn't do a timeout until the eye is actually draped to make sure that we have the right eye, the correct eye prepped and draped. Um, make sure you look at the IOL, the intraocular lens that you're going to implant, and confirm it's the correct power. 
I don't like to have a lot of IOLs in the room. I only want one intraocular lens pulled and out in the room at a time because I worry about scrub techs or nurses switching over and pulling the wrong, um, the long, wrong lens. And then one last pearl under this piece is before you go into the operating room and stop op start operating, go through all the drawers and cabinets and make sure you know where every single thing is in that operating room. This drawer has the Malugan rings. This cabinet has the CPR. Uh, this shelf has the Ahmed segments. This shelf has the iris hooks. Um, this is where we keep the extra OVD, the ophthalmic viscosurgical devices. This is where we keep the cannulas. This is where we keep the blades. This is where we keep the extra lenses. Uh, because what you don't want is to get in a situation and you need something and it's a new attending, for example, they're not used to operating in that room, or it's a new circulator and nobody knows where to get something and uh, you, you could just uh, help with that. So for both the residents and the attendings, make sure you know where things are in the operating room. Okay, so something more hands-on is where do you put your hands during cataract surgery? As a resident, I think, you know, that's like the first uh, hurdle to overcome. Like you've done everything, we've prepped and draped, we're good, we're about to start operating, and you grab the instruments and you don't know where to put them. Um, I want you to pay attention to how there the ring finger here is stabilizing the hand and the pinky or ring finger in the other hand is stabilizing the hand. You never operate free floating. Your hands are always supported when you're doing something in the eye. Um, it's a great way to unmask a tremor is by free floating. You'll see your instrument shaking. Also, you will not be as precise. So make sure you rest your hand on the patient's cheek and forehead if you're operating temporarily. Um, um, definitely you do not want to be resting on the eyelid speculum. If you push, if you put your fingers on the eyelid speculum, you're going to create a lot of posterior pressure and that'll make the surgery very difficult and give you the sensation that there's like a suprachoroidal hemorrhage going on, that, that things are pushing up so hard. Um, and then the other piece of advice is you see where these hands are positioned. If you move this, this fulcrum, this ring finger more towards the nose, like you place it here, or you place this ring finger more towards the brow uh, or towards the bridge of the nose, you're going to be driving that eye towards the nose and you're going to have that eye rotated towards the nose and you're not going to be able to visualize the anterior segment very well. Uh, so just be careful where you place your hands. Number one is don't place it on the speculum. And number two is don't get anxious and push forward with your placement and drive that eye towards the nose. Um, the next um, pearl is eye centration. Now, when I was a resident, I really struggled with eye centration. I remember um, feeling like I always had that eye in the no in the uh, near the nose. Um, one thing to remember is your instruments are controlling that eye. When a resident says, oh, the, res the patient is looking away, that's not true. If you have both instruments in the eye, you're controlling that eyeball. So uh, imagine you have a keratome blade, or a, a phaco in the keratome, and you have a chopper in the paracentesis incision. Um, what you want to be doing is holding your hands back and pushing on the internal lip of that wound, holding that eye back. Um, so the, the chopper, if you imagine this is the wound the chopper is in, you want the chopper to be pushing on this side of the wound. So it's pulling towards you to hold that eye centered in the field. Um, when I move forward with my phaco, the chopper moves against me. So there's this motion here that if the phaco moves forward, the chopper or the second instrument pushes on the wound and holds that eye steady, almost like when you're turning a horse. If I pull with one hand, if I, if I release one hand, I need to pull with the other, the rein. So when, you're, when your hands are in the incisions, when your instruments are in the incision, if the phaco goes forward, the chopper pulls that eye back. If my chopper goes forward, I lift my phaco instrument up and I pull back on the inside of that wound to hold that eye back um, as I go out with that chopper. Um, so a movement in one direction by one instrument is countered um, um, by the other instrument pushing on the wound in the opposite direction. That's a, that's a really important concept. And I find residents tend to hold instruments way too tightly. So you want to be like Muhammad Ali, where you're able to float like a butterfly, right? You have a nice light touch on the instruments, and you're able to make all these motions while you're operating. So you can pivot, change directions, go up, go down, right and left. If you're holding the instruments too tightly, you can't make those pivoting motions. Uh, the next pearl is making sure you know um, how to set up a, a FACO machine. So here you see uh, the needle going in, uh, making sure it's the right uh, tension on the uh, twist. 
and then how you put on the sleeve, making sure it goes to the correct hole and understanding fluidics that uh, fluid comes, um, that you have the a piezoelectric crystal here. There's fluid coming down the shaft of this FACO handpiece um, uh, uh, underneath the silicon tubing and out of the two side holes um, in the silicon tubing. And then the FACO needle is doing two things. It's aspirating and it's oscillating. So foot position one is irrigation coming out of that silicone sleeve. Foot position two is aspiration coming down the bore of the needle. And foot position three is FACO emulsification where that needle is actually oscillating. Um, I tell my residents all the time, you need to know what the machine sounds are. So you need to be able to listen to the machine and understand what the machine is doing. So you saw there that it was continuous irrigation going on. You hear the eh sound that is aspiration. So the resident's operating under continuous irrigation here. And you'll see a chop motion. So you'll see the right hand go vertical, the chopper go out. And look how nicely centered that eye is. And listen to the FACO. Inch, 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 inch. And then you notice there's no aspiration or phaco as the chop happens, right? So the point of this slide is make sure you know what you're listening for in the phaco machine. Understand what the phaco machine is doing uh, while you make uh, while you while you change your foot position. Um, oftentimes, when we go to learn cataract surgery, we start with divide and conquer, and uh, this is an example of a very dense lens, and we're trying to groove it. Um, a couple of things I want to point out in this lens. Number one is you want don't want this to happen where you see that lens moving away from you during the grooving. Okay, so you see these passes um, on a very dense lens. What you want to do in this situation is increase. So before we get to that, <clears throat> when you do passes, imagine this is the top of the lens and here is your FACO probe. When you go down to do a pass, you never allow that FACO probe to dive like a submarine. You never want that FACO probe to go down into the lens and you lose sight of the entire tip. The reason for that is that you're not sure where the tip is. So if I keep it on the surface, like you're a boat, you want that FACO to go across with some of the needle tip exposed at the top here. So you can do something like this. You can go deeper and do something like this. On softer lenses, you take a bigger bite. Your boat goes deeper into the water, right? Like this. If you are dealing with a dense lens, you wanna take less of a bite, something like that, okay? So in a dense lens like this, you wanna take a shallower bite, so not deep. You wanna be something like this and not like that. And you wanna go slower. A normal speed for a groove might be like this. On a dense lens, you would maybe move a little slower. And then the next thing you're gonna to wanna to do is increase the phaco energy. So you don't see that translocation of the lens like you're seeing right there. That is very dangerous. And the reason for that, when you see that lens moving like that, um, you're stressing the zonules, you're probably ripping the sub incisional zonules and you're gonna get vitreous coming up around the back like that. Um, so I wanted to review with you, number one is the mechanics of doing a groove and some strategies for grooving on a dense lens. But more importantly is like when you're first starting cataract surgery, you're not gonna pick up on these subtle signs. Um, it's really good as an attending to point out why you're asking your resident to change their technique. You say, oh, look, there is translation, translation of that lens, it's moving. I'm worried we're stressing the zonules. Let's increase the power. Let's move slower. Let's take less of a bite. I think it's really important to give the resident surgeon um, the, the reason for why you're doing something a certain way. And sometimes I'll tell my resident, there are many ways to do this. This is the way I prefer. Um, and this is the way I'm good at doing it. You should learn all the different techniques, but right now let's do it this way. Okay, so um, here's a case um, where we didn't do what I was talking about. So we um, went in, and the needle tip buried into uh, the piece right there. And when you bury your needle tip deep in and you're not controlling the foot pedal, what's gonna happen is you're gonna go through the back of the piece and you're gonna pop the posterior capsule. And you see here, we have vitreous now up in the entry. We're, we, don't, we don't notice it. So this is an old video when I was still a learning uh, attending and I didn't see this vitreous right here, you see here. And now you're gonna see the pieces falling back uh, in the back of the eye. Um, so reinforcing that concept that even when you're doing quadrant removal, you still you want to stay on the top and not bury into a piece or be aggressive with the FACO energy. 
um, because what can happen is you go through the back of the lens and now you're dealing with an open posterior capsule, a couple of quadrants that fell back and a half a nucleus that's uh, still in the um, anterior segment. Okay, so uh, we talked about this a little bit, but um, where you place your incisions is extremely important on how you can control this eyeball during surgery. Um, so you need to make sure your incisions are reproducible. The first thing you do with a keratome incision is you pick the axis of where it's gonna go. So I like to operate temporally and I like my hands to be comfortable like this as I operate. So I make a paracentesis here and I make a, a keratome incision here. Um, there are different schools of thought on how to place your incisions. Um, just make sure that you get you are consistent with it because the mechanics of holding an eye steady and the mechanics of grooving and chopping and all the different things change if we change the location of the incisions in relation to our body. So if I'm sitting temporal and all of a sudden I'm operating like this, the mechanics of holding the eye centered and doing all the manipulations I do are gonna change dramatically. And I'm probably gonna have a complication because my incisions are not where I'm comfortable. Okay, so axis placement is the first step. And then you have to decide where you're gonna put that incision on those three lines there. You wanted the middle line um, too far anterior and you get uh, stria. And it's difficult to do sub-incisional manipulations like finishing your capsular rexus sub-incisionally or um, cleaning cortex sub-incisionally. Uh, too far posterior, you cut the conjunctiva, and then you get ballooning of the conjunctiva, which can be problematic. So you want to be just inside um, the, uh, the uh, sclera here, really far posteriorly. Make sure when you're doing that incision, when you're starting it, don't push down, because if you push down, the blade will catch the conjunctiva. So when you're doing your keratoid incision, you're really floating into that eye, and there's no downward force on the eye. It's just a simple float in you know, uniplanar, biplanar, triplanar, whatever you want to do, the, the, the principle is similar. Um, I personally prefer uniplanar incisions where you go in and out. Um, they work really well in my hands. So uh, pearl number one, the step number one in making a incision, pick your axis. Number two is pick the starting point. And then number three is the wound shape. Um, so how you tilt the blade, right side down, left side down, heel down, heel up, um, so you'll get a, a funny looking wound if you have a tilt in the blade like that, and then you'll get a really long wound if you put heel down on the blade like this. You'll get a really short wound if you make a heel up incision, okay? So you need to learn how to approach a, um, a cornea to get the correct wound shape, the tilt and the heel up, heel down. Um, okay, so going back to um, disassembling a lens, it's really important that we get um, clean disassembly pieces, that the pizza is completely separated all the way to the middle and all the way to the periphery. Um, the way I teach my residents is we typically start with the divide and conquer technique where you're learning to groove and just holding that eye centered um, and learning not to dive on a piece stay on the surface as we talked about. Um, and then we progress to stop and chop or we groove, we crack, we rotate, and then we'll do a chop, usually a horizontal chop. And then we'll advance once we get that uh, down, we'll advance to horizontal and vertical chopping. We'll introduce pre-chopping um, throughout whenever we have a nice soft lens, we can pull the pre-chopper out. And on very dense lenses, I typically um, have them do a my loop. Um, a really important concept is pivoting in the wound. So you imagine you have a wound, you have an instrument. If I wanna go down, I don't push down because that opens the wound up and I lose my viscoelastic or I leak fluid. To go down, I need to lift up and drive forward to get down um, into the bottom of a, of a groove or um, into um, a chop position. So to go to lift up like that, imagine you're sitting on the eye like this and you're operating. To go down, I actually have to pivot off my ring finger and lift my hand up. Now my instrument comes in like this as opposed to coming in like that. So that ability to raise your hand up off of that pivot point, that fulcrum that you placed on the patient's face. So you'll so often, if you watch an expert surgeons operating, they'll be doing this to get deep, right? They'll raise their hands up and drive the phaco down um, into the bottom of the groove. Um, so you have to be able to seesaw the instrument. E avoid excessive downward force. If I push this eyeball down, what's going to happen is I'm pushing it into the orbit and you're going to see conjunctiva balloon up around it. So if you start seeing the eye go down or you go out of focus, 
don't push down on the wounds. You have to keep those wounds neutral in all directions, up and down, side to side, and driving it forward, okay? So uh, be, be really in tune for what you're doing with those wounds. Okay, so let's talk about cracking, right? So we talked about pivoting in the wounds. So a typical, so now I've made my groove and I have my instruments. A typical way to, the a resident will approach cracking is they'll push down to try to get in that groove like this. And that is, um, and you'll see that here, let's see. There you go. So pushing down on the wound, what's going to happen is you open up that wound and you get egress of, uh, of, the, of the saline or the BSS and you get egress of OVD and the chamber will shallow. Okay, You don't want to push down on the wounds like that to go deep. Instead, what you want to do is lift up and then drive forward in that wound to get deep into, um, into that uh, groove. So you'll lift up and then drive forward with the instrument to go deep and that keeps the wound neutral. Okay, so we talked about that. Now, for chopping, it's a similar concept, okay? So when you chop, you want to lift that instrument up like this. You wanna make contact deep on, on, the, uh, on the lens. And then you wanna do the same thing with your chopper. You wanna lift up. Um, I worry about two things with the chopper. So when I'm chopping, right, I have my chopping instrument. Here's the nucleus you wanna make contact before the anterior capsule. So make contact with the nucleus and you have a little bit of downward force on that nucleus. Make contact, make contact, make contact, drop off. And then you lift to get that chopper really deep, okay? So you lift that hand outside the eye to drop that chopper down deep around that equator. So you imagine I take my hands, I lift up, my phaco probe now is deep on that hemineucleus. My chopper, I'm lifted. I go over the surface, making contact with the lens way before the anterior capsule. Contact, contact, contact. Definitely underneath the anterior capsule. Contact, contact, contact. And then I lift because what I don't want to do is go. I lose contact with the with the lens as I go around that equator. I won't want. I don't want to pop the bag on the posterior capsule. So contact on the top. Make sure you get underneath that anterior capsule, and then contact as you make that turn around the equator. I don't want to travel this way and pop the, the posterior capsule. Um, so those, that lifting of the hands to get into chop position um, and getting deep, um, and then that, that's really important with the phaco, and then also on the chopper lifting to, to make traction on that lens, on the, on the anterior lens nucleus, and traveling, making, by, by making contact, that ensures that you go underneath that anterior capsule. I worry about two spots when you're doing a chop. I worry about you going over the anterior capsule and chopping the anterior capsule, so to avoid that, you make contact with the lens and you travel out under the lens making contact. The next thing I worry about is you lose contact around the equator and you pop the bag over here, right? So if I lose contact at the equator, I can pop the bag over here. So um, that lift gets you around the equator, keeps the contact, and now you can do a chop. Okay. Um, so there's a question, what is the difference between uh, small incision cataract surgery and phacal multiplication cataract surgery, which is more advantageous for the patient? Uh, advantageous for the patient. I mean, both are very good techniques. Um, manual small incision cataract surgery has excellent outcomes. Uh, phacal multiplication um, also has um, uh, very good outcomes. It really depends on uh, the, the clinical situation you're in, where you're operating, if where you're operating is mostly M6 and doesn't really have phaco, then you really need to be a good M6 surgeon. Um, if you have phaco emulsification and that what, that's the standard in your community amongst the other surgeons, you're going to have to learn how to do really good phaco surgery. Uh, which is better or easier for a surgeon uh, to do? Um, it really depends on that mentor. So if your mentor is confident in doing M6 over phaco, you probably need to learn M6. If your mentor is confident in phaco, you probably want to learn phaco from them. Okay, uh, so moving on, that shows that lift around the equator. Um, now, let's say we've disassembled our lens with whatever technique we want. So divide and conquer, stop and chop, horizontal chop, vertical chop, pre-chop, my loop, whatever it is, we have now got four or more pieces. Uh, what I find is that we don't spend enough time discussing how to get those pieces out. Um, so a the, the natural inclination, I think for, for most new surgeons is to try to go deep on the piece. So if this is my quadrant, 
going deep on the piece and trying to engage it down here. I don't want you engaging quadrants deep for several reasons. Number one is when you engage deep, you try to pull it up. It hits the, other, especially that first quadrant, it'll hit the other two quadrants next to it and it doesn't want to come up. You want instead to grab a quadrant at the top of the quadrant. Okay, that's super duper important for two reasons. Number one is when I grab it at the top, it rolls out like that and it's much easier to get out. Number two is as I apply FACO energy, I want as much material between as much lens material between my phaco probe and the posterior capsule, okay? So if I start down here, if I start deep on the, on the quadrant and I buzz, bzz, I, I break the posterior capsule, okay? If I start high up here on the quadrant, I have a lot of runway, I have a lot of space, I have a lot of material to buzz into before I get to that posterior capsule. So it's a safety and an efficiency issue. When you approach a, a quadrant for quadrant removal, I think of it as having three steps, okay? The first step in quadrant removal is what I call purchase, where I get a hold of that piece. And the goal of purchase is to use as little FACO as needed, but as little FACO as possible, but as, as much as needed. What do I mean by that? Um, I don't want to just bury that tip all the way in and not pay attention that I didn't need that much because now I'm just increasing the risk of the quadrant removal. Okay. How do I decrease the amount of FACO that I need to bring a quadrant up? The way you decrease the FACO energy is you maximize surface area. Imagine this is your bevel of your FACO tip. If I come in like this with my FACO tip, I'm gonna have to buzz all the way to here to occlude the tip before I can build up vacuum, okay? To use less FACO energy, what I need to do is turn my FACO probe like this and maximize the surface contact area of that open bore of the needle. Because if I do that, now I'm, I basically have occlusion right as soon as I hit aspiration. On a soft lens, it'll just come up and I'll get occlusion. On a dense lens, what I might need to do is go a little bit of FACO just to bury a little bit into that lens. Okay, so that's the first step is getting a hold. There are three steps. The purchase, the hold is the first step. So I'm gonna get a hold of it. And the next thing I do is I pull that lens out of the bag and into the iris plane. That's called the travel, okay? So to do that, you transition from the purchase where you go inch, 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 and out, okay? Now, if I imagine this is my anterior chamber, where do I want that piece sitting when I'm eating that lens material? I want the piece to be right in the middle of that chamber, which means my FACO tip is gonna be a little bit behind that. So you don't wanna to be too far forward. What I find residents do often is as they're eating a piece, they move the FACO tip forward. Um, and if you move the FACO tip forward, what's gonna happen is you get closer to that posterior capsule as you're eating up the lens material. So it's like a double whammy. I have less material with me, and I'm getting closer to the posterior capsule. What I actually wanna be doing is as I eat the piece, I pull back, okay? So the first step of getting a quadrant out is purchase, getting a hold of the quadrant. The second step is the travel, getting it out of the bag and into what I call the kill zone, a safe zone right in the middle of that anterior chamber. And then the third step is gonna be the kill. You apply FACO energy at that point to get it out. Just go ahead and apply the energy. Now. When I go to eat a quadrant in the kill, I don't want to, again, go through the back of it. I want to turn and I want to stay above the piece. I want my FACO probe to be above the piece. Don't go under it and start FACOing hard because what's going to happen is you don't know where you are and you can actually bring the bag up even if you're back. So stay high on the piece and eat it from the top. Don't eat it from the bottom. Okay. So a lot of times we break bags on quadrant removal. It's because we're not breaking that quadrant removal into three steps. The hold, which is a different foot technique than the travel, which is a different foot technique than the kill, the eating of the piece. Okay, so imagine your brain now, quadrant removal is gonna have three steps. Step number one, a hold of the piece. I don't wanna use too much FACO energy, just as much as needed, no more. And I'm gonna use my vacuum, keep it in position two, travel into the middle of the anterior chamber. And once I'm in a safe spot, I apply the FACO energy and I make sure I don't push forward. I make sure that I stay on top of the piece and not travel under it and break the bag. Okay, so those are some uh, pearls for uh, quadrant removal. So that is not how you wanna do quadrant removal deep like that. What you want is to be high like that. 
Okay, so some tips for cortical cleanup. I find residents uh, tend to go too deep with their cortical cleanup. So you imagine you have a bag and inside that bag, you have a cortex. So you have anterior capsule, anterior cortex, posterior cortex, posterior capsule. Where do you wanna be? A lot of residents like try to go way out here into the equator of the cortex. What you wanna do instead is stay right here at the tips of the anterior cortex, right where the anterior capsule is, okay? So if this is the cortex, I wanna grab it up here, stay high in that bag. And what you're trying to do is get occlusion. So I'll aspirate and I'm just trying to get cortex to fill that hole, that aspiration port and build that vacuum. Once I close off that port with cortex material, now the vacuum is gonna go up and I get a good hold of the, um, of the cortex. And what I wanna do is not eat it. I wanna hold it and I wanna strip it out of the bag, right? So I, I don't like grabbing and pulling to the middle. What I wanna do is grab and go around the um, edge of the capsule and pull as I go around, I increase the aspiration. And once I have like four or five clock hours, then I'll pull to the middle and I'll floor the foot pedal now and eat it. But you wanna wait to floor it until you're in that safe position where I'm away from the, from the capsule. Um, so those that, that's my main um, tip. Now, sub-incisionally where, is where you get kind of, um, a lot of people run into problems. Again, the same principle holds true. So if I'm sub-incisional like this, I turn my port down, I want to stay high right where that anterior capsule is. And I aspirate to occlude my tip with the loose cortex, that anterior cortex that's there. Um, there are a couple of questions here. Um, how to hold lens for chop. So if you're doing a, um, a straight horizontal chop, what you need to do is get that phaco probe um, down into the lens. You don't actually have to, uh, but you don't have to keep vacuum when that happens because once you get deep, I get my chopper out and now it's just a simple pinch. Uh, different than vertical chop. If I do vertical chop, I'm, uh, what I'm doing is I'm going down to the phaco and I'm pulling the lens up with my vacuum. So I have to keep position two and I do vertical chop. And then I take my chopper and I dive in front of the lens and I do a spread like that, okay? So for horizontal chop, you don't need to be applying a vacuum. In my experience, you can do just do a mechanical, just get that phaco probe down with aspiration or if it's denser, use phaco energy and then just do a mechanical uh, um, chop like that. One thing when you're doing horizontal chop, a lot of people tend when they're first learning uh, to do it is to push the phaco probe forward. You don't wanna do that. You wanna keep the phaco probe stable um, and then the chopper is what's traveling. You notice the movement I'm making, the phaco probe is vertical, goes down, and the chopper is what moves, and then you separate. I see a lot of residents doing this. You don't wanna push that phaco probe forward because then the whole lens dislocates and you'll stress the zonules and can break zonules. Uh, for vertical chop, what you're gonna wanna do is, again, vertical with your phaco, pro with your phaco probe, buzz down, and you go inch, 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 chop, inch, spread, inch, like that. Um, and then another question was before holding, do I have to go stick the phaco tip into the fragment or can I stay a bit further and let aspiration bring the fragment to the tip? Um, okay, so when you're doing quadrant removal, the, the, the main tip, the main uh, pearl I can give you is turning your bevel to maximize surface area contact of the phaco probe to the lens quadrant. Um, if you don't do that, you're gonna have to do a lot of phaco energy to occlude. Um, uh, so um, that, that's the main uh, piece of advice I have for you on that. Um, how to improve followability. Followability is a balance. So, so what you don't want is chatter, meaning every time I go to eat the piece, I apply phaco, the, the piece flies off and bangs around the anterior chamber and then it comes back to the tip. Um, Followability is the opposite, where the piece sticks on the tip and as I eat it, it just sits there. Now, what's pushing the piece away is the phaco energy. What's attracting the piece is the aspiration and the vacuum. So if you're getting a lot of chatter, meaning poor followability, what you wanna do is increase your vacuum, uh, potentially increase your aspiration, um, or you're maybe using too much phaco energy to back off the phaco energy a little bit. Um, so it's a balance between the attractive force of the aspiration vacuum and the repulsive force of the uh, phaco energy. Um, the next question is, I have been trained purely in M6. How easy is it to transition from M6 to phaco? I mean, it's 
uh, M6 is a beautiful, elegant surgery. I mean, I wish I wish I was better at it. I'm a, I'm a pretty good FACO surgeon. Uh, I'm not a very good M6 surgeon, unfortunately. Um, it's a different um, skill set. There are a lot of things that are similar, how to handle tissue, how to make incisions, uh, but how to handle a FACO probe and using your foot pedal, um, that definitely takes some training. I would recommend going to wet labs if you don't have that training in your um, um, facility, or maybe going to um, a place where you can get extra training like a fellowship to learn FACO if you don't have that in your residency program. Um, do you prefer bevel down or bevel up during horizontal or vertical chop? I think people do different things. I prefer bevel up. Um, I always like to see where the hole is and what's going into my FACO needle. Uh, but I think it's perfectly fine to do bevel down as well. It's just what my preference is. Um, okay, I think we answered the questions. Perfect. Um, awesome. Okay, so we talked about cortical cleanup. Um, this slide is just showing you that you need to be good with your feet. So go to your wet lab if you have one or go to the operating room after a set of cases and just put your feet on the foot pedals and get used to doing different things with a microscope foot pedal and get used to pushing on that FACO foot pedal and listen to the machine. I also recommend while you're pushing on the foot pedal, if you're in the OR without a patient, obviously, bring the machine screen in front of you and watch the diagrams on the machine. What's going on? What, what's going on with my aspiration? What's going on with my vacuum? What's going on with the FACO? Um, so I think that's a really high yield thing to do is to push on the foot pedals, know how to use them, but especially the FACO foot pedal, take the FACO machine and look at the screen and see what the foot pedal is doing. Okay, so some of pearls for attendings. Uh, we'll start with a question. Which of the following is not a characteristic of a great cataract surgery mentor? Number one, an extrovert personality type. Number two, high emotional intelligence. Number three, talented cataract surgeon. Number four, wants the trainee to be better than they are. All right, so 44% said an extrovert personality type is not a characteristic of a great cataract surgeon. You can be extroverted, but I don't think it's necessary. Um, uh, high emotional intelligence is really important that you're able to look at your resident and understand their emotions at that point. Are they stressed? Are they happy? Um, are they feeling confident? Are they feeling not confident? How are they responding to this situation that they're in? And being able to manage their emotional state um, and, and finding some way to get them over that anxiety or the fear of failure that they're experiencing at that point in time. Um, I tend to try to talk to my residents about their hobbies, about their families, their kids, their wives, their spouses, their significant others, uh, what, something to get their, you know, get them feeling like they're more comfortable in the operating room. Um, I had one resident who was a big football fan. He loved the New England Patriots. I hate the New England Patriots. I hate Tom Brady, but his favorite quarterback in the whole world is Tom Brady. His favorite team is the New England Patriots. So I just talked about the New England Patriots, even though I hated them, to calm him down. Um, so you need to find a way to get that resident, a, you have to read that resident, have that emotional intelligence, where you can tell where they are emotionally to be able to do this cataract surgery. Um, I think it's essential that a, a cataract surgery mentor is very talented and feels comfortable getting the resident out of complications, okay? So it's inevitable. Somebody learning to do cataract surgery is going to do something wrong. That's just part of it. Hopefully you're catching them and you're coaching them and you're able to avoid the complication, um, but they're going to, they're going to have a tendency to do something wrong and you catch them, or they are going to do something wrong. There's going to be vitreous. There's going to be lens pieces that drop. There's going to be a need to put a three piece lens in. There's going to be need for anterior vitrectomy. You need to feel comfortable putting CTRs in Ahmed segments, fixing the situation. What I don't want to do is take a resident who's learning and I miss something and they have a complication and then I make them feel it's their fault. Okay. Um, it's, really my responsibility to make sure they don't have a complication. And if they do have a complication, I'm gonna let them manage it if they're able to emotionally, um, mentally, uh, physically. But if they're not able to handle it, I take over and make sure that patient has a good experience as good as possible and that resident is able to recover from um, that situation. So being a talented cataract surgeon, uh, I think is extremely important. And then the last one I think is really, really essential that when I look at that resident, my goal for them at the end of the rotation is that they're a better surgeon than I am. Um, I don't want them to be mediocre. I want them to be outstanding. And if you're not, if you don't have that feeling when you're an attending in the room with the resident, maybe you shouldn't be staffing residents. Maybe you shouldn't be teaching residents because um, it's just, it's just, I think it really a, a, an essential characteristic. 
So of those, personality type of the attending, I don't think is whether you're an introvert, extrovert, you're talkative, not talkative, you're a people person, not a people. If you have that emotional intelligence, you're a talented cataract surgeon, and you want that resident to be better than you, I think that is the, um, those are the necessary ingredients. And I, I put that here as well. Being cool under pressure is also important. If you are a combustible personality type, where when you're stressed, you yell or throw things, or I don't think that makes a good resident training experience. Okay, I think the resident then becomes scared, is afraid of making mistakes, is afraid of learning, and you have to be really careful how you frame the situation for that resident. So there's something that didn't happen that was ideal. Maybe a lens piece dropped. I mean, it happens. Even good surgeons drop lenses every once in a while, right? Making sure they understand. We want to save. We want to drop more pieces. We want to make sure we have no traction on the vitreous, no traction on the retina. We want to make sure we save that anterior capsule. We want to make sure we put a three-piece lens in the sulcus. Let's talk about optic capture. Let's talk about putting triamcinolone in. Let's talk about myocol, myostat. I mean, we have a lot of learning that can happen. And then reassuring them, look, we did everything appropriately. We handled this complication appropriately. We have a retina specialist who's going to come in and clean up that lens piece that fell in the back. This patient is going to do fine. And you help them manage that patient afterwards. Okay, so... Um, I, this slide here is to show you um, how we rotate residents in our teaching institution. Uh, we have several teaching institutions. I'm at Grady. I'm the chief of ophthalmology at Grady. And what I advocated for when I first started as chief is that my residents in their senior year have one big block. Instead of doing one month here, one month there, one month there, one month there, I want all the months to come together and line them all up. Because what I don't want is somebody learning the system at Grady, learning how to operate with me, and then they leave, and then they have to relearn, and then they leave, and they relearn. I want it four months of teaching. It's almost like a mini fellowship. In those four months, our residents typically do about 200 cases, maybe more, uh, maybe a little less, but around 200 cases. And I think once they get to that number, they're um, very talented cataract surgeons. Um, so a lot of people ask me, how do you actually coach um, a resident? Um, so during their four month rotation in month one, you know, they're probably gonna do somewhere around you know, 20 to 30 cataracts. Um, I'll actually hold their hands during the cataract surgery, okay? So I'll see how tightly they're holding the instruments. I'll move their hands for them so they know how to move them. I'm looking at their hand position. Um, I'm constantly talking. Like I am nonstop commentary on their cataract surgery. This keratome incision was like this. This paracentesia was like this. I don't like how you did this. the capsorexis. Oh, that was an awesome job. Fantastic. That was really good. Awesome. Really good. Um, Obviously, you're, you're, you're talking with the realization that there is an awake patient under the drape. Um, so, you know, you have to be careful how you frame the criticism. Uh, but you, I, I'm very insistent that for the first 25 cases, there's going to be some handholding, a lot of handholding in the first few cases, less handholding as they get through the 25. And then the verbal coaching is constant for at least 50 to 75 cases. And then slowly that goes away. Like, I want by the third month, they're able to do surgery without me talking. Um, I will continue to scrub in through the third, maybe the beginning of the fourth month, but my goal is not to be scrubbing in with the resident and watching on the video screen, give them that feeling that they are um, able to do this surgery on their own. So when they leave, if I'm not sitting next to them, which I won't be, they're still able to do the surgery. And then um, taking over when things aren't going well, I will do that up until the last month. So if things aren't going well and they haven't managed this complication before, I'm going to take over and try to write the ship so they can complete the surgery and the patient has a good experience. Um, near the end of their four-month block, I'll start letting them have more leeway in managing their complications. But definitely the first three months are building a foundation and we want to maintain the resident's um, uh, confidence. Um, I'm going to stop there. I've uh, talked a lot and uh, let's answer some, some questions here from the Q&A. Um, how do you keep the wound neutral during cortical cleanup? I think there is an extremely important concept with instruments in the keratome incision. The way I keep the eye neutral with a, with a bimanual, I'm sorry, a coaxial eye handpiece is I lift my hand up and I lock that wound and I hold it back, okay? So when I'm doing this or I'm doing that, I'm always putting some backward force on that wound with my hand piece, okay? So that's extremely important. Um, what is your preferred technique for soft nucleus? Um, there are many ways of dealing with a soft nucleus. If it's a young patient who's like in their 30s and they've got a diabetic cataract, we'll just go in with the IA handpiece and not use the FACO at all. Um, if, um, 
if there, it's a little denser than that, we'll probably use a pre-chopper. We can do divide and conquer. We can do horizontal chop. It just, you have to be careful on these soft lenses when you're aspirating and phacoing. You can take a lot more with the phaco needle than what you were anticipating. And there's a risk of breaking the posterior capsule, okay? So um, soft nuclei can be challenging and you can, especially like if it's a white cataract and it's soft, you can move the whole thing and pop the bag without even uh, realizing what's happened. Um, so the next question, uh, does the difference in tip and sleeve phaco affect the process if different sizes? Um, the, the, um, the principles are the same. So if you use a different uh, keratone blade and a different sleeve, um, perfectly acceptable, 2.4, 2.2, 2.8, 3.2, just make sure you're using the correct sleeve for the incision, okay? So there are different sleeve sizes that fill the incision. What you don't want is to use a small sleeve on a big incision and that incision is leaking a lot and you get an unstable chamber, okay? So um, that's all, uh, all, the, all the different sizes are acceptable. Just make sure you pick the right sleeve. And the other thing is when you're making a keratome incision, right? You go in, you need to go out on the same track, okay? Make sure that you don't widen the wound as you come out. If I widen the wound, then the sleeve is not gonna close off that wound and you're gonna get too much leak. Um, yeah, so we, how do you maintain the eye centrally? We talked about this a little bit, but you have two instruments in the eye during FACO. If I'm pushing forward with the right hand, the left hand is pushing against that motion. If I'm moving my chopper forward, I'm taking that FACO and I'm putting it in the wound in a way that I can pull back on that posterior aspect of the wound. So pulling back with the FACO as I go out with the chopper. Um, <clears throat> how to do cort uh, cortex aspiration under the main incision safely. We talked about that a little bit, but I think what happens sub-incisionally, if you imagine this is your capsule, a lot of residents, a lot of people try to go too deep with their IA handpiece. You wanna be very high right here, right at the tip of the anterior capsule as I'm going to aspirate the cortex. That keeps me far away from the posterior capsule and allows all that anterior cortex to jump into my probe and occlude it. Um, we do capsorexis from the main incision or side port. Um, you can do it from the side port. You'd need to do a bimanual IA, you'd have, to have another incision, and you'd have a bimanual um, incision. Uh, the next question is uveitic lens may pose difficult difficulty to dislocate. Yeah, uveitic cataracts are a whole separate lecture. I did a fellowship in uveitis, and I did a lot. I do a lot of uveitic cataracts. Um, we can uh, we can schedule another talk only about uveitic cataracts and the nuances in that. Uh, does this procedure apply to known diabetic? Uh, for diabetics, <clears throat> if you have a patient who is diabetic, uncontrolled, and their vision is like 2400 in both eyes, I usually don't wait until the diabetes is controlled before doing one of the eyes because they can't take their medicines, they can't take their insulin, they can't see to do all this stuff. So <clears throat> if, if they have one eye that's seeing okay, and the other eye has a bad cataract, I'll probably hold off on the cataract surgery until their diabetes is better controlled. <clears throat> Uh, but you have to make sure the patient is able to follow their, their, uh, their medical um, regimen. Um, my clinic allows only one cataract surgery per week for a resident. Do you think, is it enough or should I find another clinic to learn the surgery? Um, I mean, <clears throat> I find that um, residents really pick up their learning as they do multiple surgeries in a day. So I personally like a resident to do at least four cataracts in a day, if not more. I really like it when they do eight a day or 10 a day uh, because you're reinforcing um, teaching points from one case to the next and they're really picking up a lot of skills. So I think the repetition on the same day is really important. Uh, how many days a week are trainees in the OR during this four month period? So typically it's uh, two to three days. So we have two senior residents on rotation, and we split the days between them. One is Monday, Wednesday, Friday. The other one is Tuesday, Thursday. And every month they switch. So one month they'll be Monday, Wednesday, Friday. The next month they're Tuesday, Thursday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, then Tuesday, Thursday. Um, okay, and then the next question is how to handle, handle polar cataracts in beginners. Um, I typically don't, so residents who are just starting out, they you wanna book more bread and butter cases. So posterior polar cataract is not something I'd want a resident doing on their first 25 to 50 cases. They have to have some foundation. I would, I would book that either with a resident who has more experience um, or wait on that surgery until that resident is able to handle it. How do you involve as a mentor with the resident fail at surgery? Um, so I think it's important as the mentor, you don't allow the resident to fail at surgery. Like you're there coaching and monitoring and controlling the environment. 
And if a complication happens, you take over and you fix it. Um, you know, fail at surgery, that would, that would damage my psyche. If I went in and um, somebody allowed me to screw up a surgery, I would never want to do that surgery again. And that's not our goal. Our goal is to generate surgeons who can do surgery. So uh, I think it's really important that we prevent residents from having complications. And when they do have complications, which they are going to eventually have complications, uh, taking over and making sure they have a good experience. Um, what is your recommendation for the prevention of iris prolapse during FACO? That's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> so we, on, on patients who are on an alpha uh, uh, a blocker, uh, we put them on, we, we put epinephrine and the lidocaine uh, as one preventive measure. And then um, we make sure that we're careful when we're doing hydrodissection, not too forceful because that'll cause iris prolapse. Um, and then the real key is when you're going in and out with an irrigating instrument like a FACO probe or an IA handpiece is not to go in irrigating. First, you go in, no irrigation, a, close the, the wound with your silicone sleeve, and then turn on the irrigation. When you're coming out, turn off your irrigation while you're still inside the eye and make the eye soft by pushing on the, on the, uh, on the paracentesis incision or coming out very slowly and allowing to, to leak around that sleeve very slowly and come out. You don't wanna come out or go in under high uh, pressure situation uh, in the eye from the irrigation. Um, so if I do get iris prolapse, the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna decrease the pressure in the eye by burping the paracentesis. If I can't get the paracentesis to burp enough, um, uh, enough fluid or OVD, what I'll do is I'll take my cannula, go into the main wound over the iris and just push down and get, um, get material out of the AC that way. Once I've softened the eye, I will irrigate the surface and then I'll massage the anterior uh, lip of that um, cornea to get that iris to, excuse me, reposit back in. Um, give some tips on IFAS management. We talked about that. Can you expl explain the trick to insert the iris hook, please? Um, unfortunately, we're out of time for the last two questions. Uh, we can book some more uh, time on the Orbis platform to go over some of these other questions. A lot of uh, great questions. Thank you so much for being so interactive and, and taking the time out of your days all across the world here. Um, really appreciate everybody's time and I hope uh, you found this beneficial. Thank you so much.